you are in for a treat today. Today in Black History Month and just over a month after his birthday, we come together to talk about the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and how his legacy has intertwined with Stanford's. For more than three decades, Stanford has been at the forefront of scholarship about Dr. King's legacy through the Martin Luther King Jr. Research and Education Institute. Our panelists will discuss the Institute's mission and the Martin Luther King Jr.'s Papers Project, embodying King's own words, you can kill the dreamer, but you can't kill the dream. Today, I'm excited to moderate this session and share the virtual Stanford stage with our presenters, Tanisha Armstrong and Lerone Martin. First, Tanisha Armstrong is a Stanford alum and the King's Paper Project Director, overseeing King's most significant sermons, speeches, correspondence, published writings, and unpublished manuscripts. Tanisha has co-edited several volumes, including Volume 5, Threshold of a New Decade, January 1959 through December 1960, and Volume 7, To Save the Soul of America, January 1961 through August 1962. She is currently working on Volume 8, September 1962 through December 1963. In Tanisha's spare time, she likes to spend time with her niece and four nephews. Second, I'd like to introduce to you Dr. Lerone Martin, the Martin Luther King Jr. Centennial Professor, Associate Professor of Religious Studies, and Director of the Martin Luther King Jr. Research and Education Institute at Stanford University. He is the author of the award-winning book, Preaching on Wax, the Phonograph, and the Making of Modern African American Religion, and the recent book, The Gospel of J. Edgar Hoover, Hoover, excuse me, how the FBI aided and abetted the rise of white Christian nationalism. For his research, he has received a number of nationally recognized fellowships. He has been recognized for his teaching, receiving institutional teaching awards, as well as fellowships from the Wabash Center for Teaching and Learning in Theology and Religion. In Lerone's spare time, he likes to play and watch basketball. We like to give you a little scholarly background and let you know what they like to do on the personal side as well, as good, as good Stanford uh, affiliated folks do. So first we'll feature Tanisha, who will talk about the King's Papers Project, and Lerone, who will join later in the webinar to talk about the Martin Luther King Jr. Research and Education Institute. After the presentation, we'll have time for Q&A, so be sure to add your questions to the Q&A, and over to you, Tanisha. Thank you, Professor Rawl, for that introduction, and thank you to the Alumni Association for inviting me to speak about the work of the King Papers Project. The Martin Luther King Jr. Papers Project was founded in 1985 when Mrs. Coretta Scott King and Stanford professor and historian Claiborne Carson to edit her late husband's papers. As a documentary edition, the King Papers Project makes King's words available in its historical context. The project's principal mission is the publication of the papers of Martin Luther King Jr., a 14 volume annotated definitive edition of King's most historically significant speeches, sermons, correspondence, and unpublished manuscripts. With the exception of one volume, our volumes are published in chronological order. Thus far, we've published seven volumes. Volume one, which starts in 1929 with the birth of King in Atlanta, Georgia, was published in 1992. And volume seven, January 1961 through August 1962, was published in 2014. The seven already published volumes have become essential reference works for researchers and have influenced scholarship about King and the movements he inspired. One historian said of the volumes, and I quote, an hour spent with the volume in this series is virtually equivalent to a conversation with Martin Luther King Jr. End quote. Each volume is a tremendous undertaking. It takes seven years from start to finish to complete a manuscript. We are currently working on volume eight, September 1962 through December 1963, our most anticipated volume in our series, because it will chronicle a critical period in United States history, including the 1962 integration of Old Miss by James Meredith, the Birmingham campaign, the March on Washington for jobs and freedom, King's relationship with President John F. Kennedy, the November 1963 assassination of the president, and the alleged communist infiltration of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference of which King was president. Volume eight will feature many noteworthy documents, such as a letter from Malcolm X 
to King, dated July 1963, inviting King to New York City to participate in a Muslim rally to discuss the, quote, race problem. A copy of King's March on Washington program with a note from King's lawyer and speechwriter, Clarence B. Jones, notifying him that African-American scholar and co-founder of the NAACP, W.E.B. Du Bois, had died. And finally, the March 1963 telegram from King to John F. Kennedy pleading for federal intervention in the wake of police brutality in Greenwood, Mississippi. While many of you are hearing of the King Papers Project for the first time, our research may be more familiar to you. For example, when conducting research on volume two, Rediscovering Precious Values, July 1951 through November 1955, we discovered that King had plagiarized parts of his dissertation. While we tried to keep this revelation under wraps until the publication of the manuscript, it was leaked to the press, and articles on this development were published all over the country, including the LA Times and the New York Times. Another groundbreaking achievement was the sermon volume, Advocate of the Social Gospel, September 1948 through March 1963. As I mentioned earlier, this is the only volume that breaks from our chronological series. The volume provides a unique look at King's never before published early sermons, drawn from a private file of materials King kept in his study and used to prepare his homilies. In 1997, Coretta Scott King granted the King Papers Project permission to examine papers stored in the basement of the King family home. Imagine a battered cardboard box with a trove of sermon notes, outlines, and full-text sermons from the years up to and including King's involvement in the Montgomery bus boycott in 1956, a period of which few of King's religious writings have been available previously. This find was a historian's dream, and we put the chronological series on hold immediately and published these materials that we knew would be of immense importance to King and religious scholars alike. In addition to our primary mission to publish the papers of Martin Luther King, our secondary mission is to train the next generation of scholars and historians. In 1998, I was one of the young people who was given the opportunity to work with the then staff of the King Papers Project. I had just graduated from UC Santa Cruz and I was offered an eight week internship with the project. And it was a transformative experience for me. I was working with the largest depository of King related documents, primary documents, transcribing recordings of King that I certainly had never heard before and conducting research for documents selected for publication in volume four. I also got the opportunity to meet movement activists that worked alongside Dr. King, such as Vincent Harding, who helped Dr. King shape his stance on the Vietnam War. Lucky for me, the project was looking for a research assistant and I was hired on staff soon thereafter. And that was 25 years ago. While we no longer have an internship that draws from potential candidates from around the world, we still offer the same rigorous experience to Stanford students during the academic and summer sessions that I received so many years ago. Undergraduates that work with us gain research skills equivalent to a second year graduate student. Students contribute to every phase of manuscript preparation, receiving one-on-one -on -one instruction from well-trained staff on archival, library, internet, and database research. Students typically start with document cataloging, move on to transcription, newspaper research, and HTML, followed by annotation research and writing, and finally, proofreading and fact-checking the manuscript. Through every phase of the work, students experience the rigors of academic publishing and gain skills that can be used in any academic discipline. I'm going to stop here and hand over the presentation to Dr. Martin, who will discuss the future of the King Institute. What we have here is a treasure trove here at Stanford. Um, it is absolutely amazing, as Tanisha showed you. We are uniquely situated um, with these resources to really talk about Martin Luther King Jr. and his importance to the nation and to the world. Our documents, as you've seen, um, we have the most primary documents. Um, we have connections with other folks who have 
items of Martin King, but all of them come through here in order for um, to be edited and published. And so on the next slide, uh, we'd like to point out a little bit about what we do um, with these documents. So we maintain um, the world's largest online archive of King materials. Um, we also are the most visited King-related site on the internet as a, re as a result. We maintain an extensive digital document database for use by the Institute staff, scholars, and the public. And as you've heard from Tanisha, we are able to give people access to previously inaccessible King speeches, sermons, and letters. And one of the things that I love about the story that Tanisha shared with you is not just about the excitement that Tanisha had of being present at Coretta's house. I mean, that alone is amazing. But then also discovering this box. And what I love about the sermon volume in particular is that it gives an opportunity for us to read Martin Luther King Jr. in a new way. Most of us are familiar with the I Have a Dream speech. We're familiar, even most of us, with the Promised Land speech, the last sermon he gave before his death. But what the volume on the sermons, volume six, what it allows is for us to actually walk with Martin Luther King Jr. as he pastors people through life's ups and downs. Sermons such as Three Dimensions of a Complete Life or sermons about how to live with prosperity or how to live with poverty. These sorts of sermons allow us to see King in a new light. It is pastoring human beings who are, of course, facing racism, but they're also facing things such as divorce or separation or marital troubles. And that volume allows us to see King as a pastor in a new way. And that's one of the things that I love so much about that volume and how what we've been able to bring to the world in terms of these previously inaccessible items. On the next slide, we have um, some things that we do here at the King Institute that we build upon this wonderful foundation of research that Tanisha talked about and that Tanisha leads for us. Part of that is through education. Of course, we offer courses here at Stanford to our undergraduates. We've found that the a course we offer here on Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X has been extremely a popular elective here, um, having almost 100 students the first time we taught it. So I'm very excited about the momentum of building off of that course. We also um, are offering a course right now to high school students. We are piloting a program um, right now through a Stanford Digital Education where we are modeling right now and piloting a program where we have students, 25 students at Camden Prep in Camden, New Jersey, who are taking a class with us right now on Martin Luther King Jr. virtually. And this is the beautiful part. They are receiving Stanford credit for this course. So this is a high school in Camden, New Jersey. It's a Title I high school, meaning at least 40% of the students are on free or reduced lunch. Many of them will be first generation college students. And so through this class, we not only are preserving and promoting the work and legacy of Martin Luther King Jr., but we are actually helping to, um, to help students to be prepared for college and they're getting Stanford credit. They have Stanford email addresses, they have access to our online resources, and they have access to our online um, learning management um, software. So we're piloting, piloting that course right now with students who are learning about Martin King and also preparing themselves for college. And that alone, I think, excites them and lets them know that they are able to do the work and they're going to have this Stanford credit on their transcript no matter where they go. Closely connected to that, we're doing a college prep program. We'll start that next summer. We're going to bring students, primarily first generation, will be first gen students, high school, high school students from around the country who will come to campus here to be with us and take a class on Martin King and receive credit and again, be prepared for college. We think the course that we're doing right now for high school students virtually, we think that course is wonderful. We think the course is helping to prepare students but we think there's nothing like actually being on a college campus, especially the beautiful campus we have here at Stanford. So we want to bring some of these students to campus to have to do work and to attend classes and to be here for about three weeks and get credit and help to open up their imagination. So like Martin King Jr., they can dream and see themselves in a new way 
as they come to campus and take a course with us at the MLK Institute. We also have, of course, what Tanisha talked about is our King Research Fellowships. This is where we have our undergraduates here at Stanford who come and do work with Tanisha and Tanisha's staff to work on the King Papers projects. So actually, again, as Tanisha said in her wonderful, um, as I'll say, testimony, since we're talking about Reverend King, what Tanisha said about her own testimony of being a student and meeting people she never thought she'd meet, hearing things she never thought she'd hear. Tanisha leads a wonderful program here of our research fellowships. We have students who apply to work with us here at Stanford. And here again, they're learning research skills, but they're also learning about one of the greatest Americans to ever live. On our next slide, we have some of our other activities that we do here um, at the King Institute. Um, we do work as it relates to public impact. So as you know, what we do, some of the work is through a form of our publications. What um, the previous director, Dr. Carson, was able to do was pull together from some of the archives that we have here on things that King said about himself and pulled those together and put those into something we call the autobiography of Martin Luther King Jr. Unlike Malcolm X, King never sat down to write an autobiography, but he talked a lot about himself and his experiences. And so we were able to put many of those thoughts and reflections together in the autobiography of MLK, including his courtship of Coretta, which is really beautiful to read as Tanisha showed earlier, the wonderful uh, Valentine's Day card. Um, we also have an MLK encyclopedia, which is available through our website, which you've seen in the chat, which is allows you to see some things about MLK and to search certain ideas or quotes or sayings that we might have, we might have access to through the encyclopedia. Tanisha mentioned earlier Clarence Jones. Clarence Jones was King's uh, personal attorney and also speech collaborator. So in honor of Clarence Jones, who's still alive and is still around, he even has come to visit the Institute. He used to be housed here. He wrote a book while he was here, a book called What Would Martin Say? And Clarence actually comes around and has even attended class. And so students here get a great kick out of him telling stories about MLK and about um, his time with Martin King. And so in honor of him, we have a Clarence B. Jones Scholar Writer in Residence program where we have invited scholars to spend a short time with us to have access to some of our resources here at the King Institute as they're working on stuff as it relates to Martin King and the broader civil rights movement. We haven't done that in quite some time because of a thing that most of us are familiar with known as COVID, but we look forward to launching that again and working with experts who are writing on King and having them with us. We also, of course, do events that are designed to enhance the public understanding of King's life ideas and his legacy. And we do those events both virtually and also increasingly now in person across the country. So as we get ready to close, we'll go to the next slide. And I wanna talk briefly just about what it means to have Martin Luther King Jr. and what it means um, um, to have King and have access to all of King's um, um, personal archive here. And I think that um, Stanford is really, really special in this regard, that we have um, not only that King visited campus twice, but we have the King Research and Education Institute here. And it's important because our mission is to preserve and promote King's work and its legacy. And we have to consider the way that Martin Luther King Jr., while lionized today, and the only person who was not a president who has a statue on the National Mall, we have to realize that King was not always loved and he was not always welcomed and not always considered an American patriot. King, in fact, was actually deemed by the FBI as one of the most dangerous Negroes, and that's a quote, facing the country, and that King was leading a racial revolution. This is the FBI, what the FBI said about Martin King. The FBI stalked him, they hunted him down, they sent him an anonymous letter written in the form from another Black Christian saying that King would be exposed for some of his quote-unquote personal moral failings. He was constantly under surveillance and pressure. Clarence, Clarence Jones, who I mentioned earlier, King's personal attorney, shared with us on more than one occasion that when King was at one point in time, because of all the weight of the pressure of getting death threats, not just from white supremacists, but also from the FBI, 
and also being um, opposed by members of the clergy, both black and white. The king was experiencing a bout, a bout of depression. We have to remember that one of the things that this project does is help to humanize Martin Luther King Jr., just not just being a hero, but actually being a human being. And King was experiencing a great deal of depression. And Clarence Jones said many of them took King to see his physician. And King's physician said that Martin King needed to see a therapist, that he needed medical attention because of his depressive state. And Clarence and others around Martin King understood and knew that that was true, but the danger in that, they feared that the FBI would act, get access to the therapist's notes and get access to some of the things that King was discussing and use it against him to make it seem as if Martin King was mentally unstable, that his freedom dreams were not that of an American patriot, but of someone who suffered from mental illness. And so think about that, that Martin Luther King Jr., could not even see a therapist because of the pressure the FBI put against him. This is part of the, the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. that the King Papers Project helps us to remember that history is so important that while we lionize him today and he seems as a hero today, we have to remember that King in his fullness, his concerns not just about racism, but also poverty and war made him an enemy of the state. And our project helps to put King both in historical context, so we understand his radical nature, but also to allow us to reflect on that radical nature today and what that means for all of us today. For those of us who say that we want to continue his dream and continue to move things forward in this country in a manner that Martin Luther King dreamed about. We are so excited that we are able to share this with you all today. Um, we're going to bring in Raquel to have a time of question and answer, and we look forward to answering any questions you might have about the Papers Project or the Research Institute, and as we move forward into the future and try to preserve and promote King, his legacy, and his work. Thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you both. And and I know I'm learning things and taking notes. And so I'm sure our, our audience has as well. And so we have some questions. Continue to put those in the chat and we will answer as many as we can in, in the next 35 minutes or so. But I'm going to continue on with sort of this uh idea of thinking about testimonies and tests, right? And as the church says, you, you can't have a testimony without the test, right? And so the first question is for you, Tanisha, because I really appreciated you giving us that story about 25 years you've been doing this, right? And, and in this game, right? What are the biggest challenges you have faced during this project? And what are the challenges that lie ahead? Um, I think one of the challenges um, is that even though King is a universal figure and is someone who's revered um, in, um, in our society, a lot of people still aren't quite ready to talk about the civil rights movement. Um, it's been difficult um, oftentimes to get those people who we want to know their testimonies. We want to know just um, how they worked with King, but in a lot of ways, it was a traumatic experience for people. And even though you know we're 50, 60 years um, beyond that, we there's still a lot of hurt and pain there. And so um, I think that's one of the, the the most difficult aspects of my work is is trying to to make people understand that it's not just the stories of Martin King that I'm interested in, I'm interested in their stories as well, because there would not have been a Martin King if it wasn't for all the foot shoulders that participated in the movement. And so I think that's probably the most difficult. I think Tanisha is absolutely right. And I would only add to that. I think that because Martin Luther King Jr. has become an icon, I think part of our challenge is to um, unsettle some preconceived notions about him and that a lot of people think they they know Martin King, right? I know that I have a dream speech, but there's so much there. Um, so I think our challenge at times is to try to reintroduce Martin Luther King Jr. to a broad public audience, to an audience that, that thinks they might know everything about him. I think an increasing challenge that I see in the future, I would add, is that in 2027, um, according to the court ruling, um, some of the FBI's surveillance and transcriptions of King, um, audio transcriptions of King 
will be um, un, will be released by the National Archives in 2027. So I might anticipate um, in a couple of years from now, we might experience um, a challenge of how to put those in context. Some people might want to take those things and use them against Martin King to detract from some of the things that he did. But I think that'll be a challenge for us to try to put those in context that we're talking about an FBI that was bent on destroying him. And so I think that'll be a challenge for us, but it's a challenge that we'll, we'll be prepared for. Yeah, thank you for that. So, Lauren, I'm going to stay with you from one of the questions we have in the Q&A, just thinking about building on that, you know, reintroducing who King was and all these different things. Are, are there particularly powerful pieces or writings that you think that we should know about that we don't necessarily you talked about everyone knows I have a dream right I and mean, we can recite a couple lines and that sort of thing but are there other things that aren't as popular that you think folks should know about and um why do you find them powerful and and not as popular you know I think the speech King gave here um at Stanford is is one powerful one the other America which is available online and on our website as well I think it's been posted in the chat that's the powerful one, um, because this is where you hear Martin King tie the three um, concerns he had about America together so well. He'd been doing it all his career, but to tie together racism, poverty, and militarism or war, he ties them together so well. I think it's a powerful, powerful, powerful speech. In fact, the African-American um, comedian um, an entertainer, uh, Byron Allen, had even mentioned um, and even posted this about this speech about how powerful he found it. And I think it's 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 relevant because in that speech, in front of a Stanford audience, a majority um, white audience at the time, Martin Luther King Jr. proposes a universal basic income program, all the way back in 1967. And that's something that politicians are still wrestling with today and thinking about and talking about. One of our own alums, of course, was inspired by inspired by this um, to start the program as it relates to um, mayors for universal um, uh, universal basic income, Michael Tubbs. So I think that um, um, that's a really, really, really important speech. And I would only add to that the letter from Birmingham jail, which I think is well known, but not read as much. And I mentioned that because we're coming up on the 60th anniversary of that letter. And I think that letter is still very powerful, still very important for us to read to for how King lays out his understanding of protest and when it's one's moral obligation to um, defy a man written law. So I find that to be powerful as well. And Tanisha, I'll, I'll see if you want to add, you know, if there's a particular piece, but I'm going to add this other caveat, the question that came in is sort of, what is the most fascinating thing that you learned about King and his life while working on this project, right? That's a, that's a great question too. I learned, you know, I learned something new every day um, while working here, but I think the, the thing that I find interesting is that, and a lot of people don't, don't know this about Dr. King, was that he wrote an advice column for Ebony Magazine in 1957 and 1958 um, called Advice for a Living. And he answered questions about inter, interracial marriage, homosexuality, um, the death penalty, friendships, premarital sex, I mean, all kinds of, of, of things. And so you get this glimpse of him as someone that the, the public trusts. So he's being a pastor, but in a public, in a very public way. He's being a pastor and being able to to administer to people um, as um, through you know through Ebony Magazine. I just I find that so fascinating and 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 some of the the the, the answers to his questions um, are are fascinating. They're great answers. Um, tip some of some of them are typical answers for for the time period for the 1950s 1960s. Um, but you do learn a lot about King and his thought process. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, so I want to turn back to you, Ronan, and just ask, you gave us some of the, the history, right? And I'm going to bridge two questions here. One, um, someone's asking, you talked about two speeches, like King was here, 1967. They want to know when the other one was. They try to get all the facts and all the data, right? That sort of thing. But also, can you, can you talk to us a little bit about what you know, right, of why King's family chose Stanford as the repository for, for these papers? 
So Tanisha, let's tag team this one. I believe we were we were talking to an alum this week, Tanisha, Tanisha uh, um, and I were. It's 1958, is that right? Or 59, Tanisha? I, Do I don't recall. recall no. King came and spoke um, to a professor's class here on campus. Um, and the alum was telling us about it. Um, and um, so that was in the late 50s. It was after the Montgomery bus boycott, but prior to the um, March on Washington. So I believe it's 58 or 59, but it was not a university-wide, um, I think, lecture. It was something that he came to speak to a class. Um, I think that um, my understanding about the origins of why Coretta chose Stanford was that, um, as Tanisha mentioned earlier, um, Vincent Harding was one of King's collaborators. In fact, was responsible for a great deal of King's speech against the Vietnam War in 1967. Coretta had reached out to him and asked who she thought, who he thought would be great to edit um, Martin's papers. By this time in, in the 19, mid 1980s, America's about to celebrate its first Martin Luther King Jr. holiday. And Coretta is concerned with people not just reading about Martin, but she wanted people to read Martin, to read some of his ideas and works and writings. And Vincent Harding, um, who knew King, thought that Claiborne Carson um, would be a, a great person to do that because Claiborne had just written a book on SNCC, then the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And um, so she rec he recommended Claiborne and then Coretta called him on the phone and that's how everything be uh, began rolling and, and the, the King Papers Project ended up coming here uh, to Stanford. Tanisha, I don't know if you wanted to add. I mean, the papers are 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 here because Dr. Carson was was here. Um, but I do think it's important to note that um, there's a kind of a, a little funny story but behind that, in that Dr. Carson, like um, Dr. Martin said, had spent his career, you know, um, researching and writing the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And so this is a, 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 a grassroots organization. And so he was really not someone who had spent his career um, uh, writing about top-down leadership, meaning from the leadership perspective of, of a Martin King. And so um, he had to think long and hard about whether or not this was something that he wanted to undertake. And someone said to him, are you really going to turn down Coretta Scott King? Like, can you really do that? Um, and he he thought about it and he thought that this was a, a great opportunity because not only, as I, I, I said earlier, not only do we um, do we focus on King in, in all of our volumes, we also focus on the people who made King who he was. And so um, we try to do that in, in, in every document that we choose um, to, to publish, we try to illuminate the stories of untold, of untold, untold untold heroes. Thank you for that. So I'm going to throw this one out and whoever wants to take it first, we can go with that. But um, it's been liked a lot. So folks are interested. Can you talk about the King's transition from race to class as a central theme of the movement? I would say that Martin King always saw race and class as, 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 as together. I think that the best way to understand it is that King articulated it this way. He said that the fight for against racial discrimination he saw as a fight for African-American dignity. Just that African-Americans could see themselves as being equal to anyone else um, in this country. And then that was just a fight for, for dignity. He said the next step then was to attack poverty and to attack the um, other aspects of American life, not just public aspects about public accommodations, but the private sphere, housing, education, things of this nature. King saw that as the real fight for equality. So he always saw those two um, together. And I think that's important to point out. Um, but his efforts in attacking them, he saw them as linked, but he started off thinking about racial discrimination because that was the most obvious thing, seeing signs up that said white only, black only. And then after um, legal segregation was ended in this country, he then makes the pivot towards thinking about the private sphere in life and thinking about poverty, because he sees those two things as intricately connected. And I just want to say shout out to Hugh Brady, who had been who had been reaching out to Tanisha and I. Um, 
King appeared in 1958 in Mulford uh, Sibley's poli sci class. So I was, I was, I knew it was 58 or 59. So I think I got it right. So shout out to Hugh. Thanks for that. Yeah, thank you. All right. So the next question is just thinking about how this repository ties into the MLK holiday, the memorial in DC, and the museum in Georgia. Is there inter any interconnectivity at all? Folks are folks are curious. We did, we did have a part in the memorial. Um, we, along with Dr. Carson, were uh, charged with picking the quotes for the memorial. So we gave them um, a list of quotes from the documents that we had at our disposal. Um, and then we uh, presented those to the, the committee and the committee chose which quotes they wanted to align the walls of the, of the King Memorial. And what was your other question? It was also about um, just the holiday, the memorial, all things King. I think they're trying to make that tie is, you know, is this sort of what I'm assuming and that, that person could let me know, but is it, are y'all a go-to, right, for, for all things Martin Luther King first and foremost, and have you sort of established yourselves in that? Going back to Lerone, you're giving those stats, it's like the most cited website, you know, the, the site that everyone goes to and all these sorts of things. So I think that they're just trying to see the connectivity across anything related to, to Martin Luther King at, at the larger stage. Yeah, I, I think we I think we are. I think we are the go-to people. Um, you know, to be honest with you, we're the only people who can do this in the world. We're the only people who do it in the world, um, it, which is to edit Dr. King's papers. We have permission to do that from the King estate. And so um, I think that um, especially when it comes to the King holiday and Black History Month, um, we get lots of phone calls. People want to know what we know, uh, if we can verify quotes, if we can. So we're, we're constantly very busy during those first two months of, of the new year um, uh, with, um, with people who want to know um, you know, how, what, how many people ask us the, sometimes the weirdest questions. Sometimes they want to know how many streets are there in the world named after Martin Luther King. <laughs> uh, we, we get that one pretty frequently and we, we don't have an answer to that one, but we, we pretty frequently have an answer to most questions that come our way. Tanisha is absolutely right. And another space that you can see um, the significance of the work that we do here is if you look at any single book that's written about Martin King Jr. If you look at the citation, it's citing the work that Tanisha has done over all these years. And so what we know about Martin Luther King Jr., whether it's his baby photo, whether it's you know being stabbed in, in Harlem, or if it's about anything about Martin King Jr., you look at the, the footnotes and all of it comes back to the King Papers Project. So we are not only have you know, permission from the estate to do this, um, the work we've done has been transformed the public understanding of Martin Luther King Jr. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for adding that. So, Tanisha, in your words, is y'all are the only people to do it in the world, right? right? There's another question I think that is related is sort of how can alums see the papers in person? Are they able to see the papers in person if this is not happening anywhere else, but at Leland Stanford Junior University, right? How, how can folks get access? Well, just send us an email and set up a time to come by. Um, we do have an exhibit in the hallway that we we uh, like to take people down down our exhibit and show them around. And then you can um, also get a chance to see the papers. We'll show you our database um, that our, all of our documents are cataloged in. And then that, that gives you the network of, into about 40,000 records that are cataloged. And we have about 300,000 more documents uh, on site that have not been cataloged quite yet. But you can come and see the papers, just make an appointment. And in the meantime, and in the meantime, for those who can't, you know, our website again, right, has a number of things, including what I love, what Tanisha mentioned, the Ebony magazine we have uh, on our website. You can look through King's advice column in Ebony magazine and see him trying to uh, address certain things um, that people go through in everyday life. And you'll find aspects where King is light years ahead in his thinking. Mm -hmm. And then you'll see aspects where King is seeming to be kind of stuck in prehistoric times, especially mm -hmm. as it relates to gender relationships, right? Mm -hmm. So, and those who can't make it, our website is the next best thing. 
Yeah, thank you for that. So let, let's continue with just a little bit about alums and, and getting connected. But there's a question. Um, as we learn more about Martin Luther King Jr., what are some of the things we can do as Stanford alums to honor his legacy and continue the work within the movements he inspired? That's a great question, too. I, I would say, you know, the King Center every year has this saying, which is the King holiday is not a day off, it's a day on. And so it's a time to be connected with your communities, going out in your communities and helping out. Um, and um, one of the things that I, I loved when I was a, an intern here um, several years ago is that we did Habitat for Humanity. Um, and that's been in the news recently with, the, with um, uh, President Carter going into to hospice care. Um, but um, just going out in your communities and 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 really, um, he he prided himself on 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 service. That's what he when he eulogized himself um, at at um, Ebenezer Baptist Church. He talked about being someone who wanted he wanted to be remembered for his service, and not necessarily remembered for his PhDs and all these other kinds of things, these awards that he's that he um, has obtained. But he wanted to be remembered for somebody who tried to help someone. That's right. That's right. And 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 I think if, to, to focus that, if it's not Habitats for Humanity, King cared about three things, racism, poverty, and militarism or war. So any place you, you see that in your community, racism, whether it's in your community or interpersonal relationships on the job, poverty and acts of violence, if you see that and then you confront that in the best way that you can, using your resources, your time and your talent, that's honoring Martin Luther King Jr. as well. Standing up against those triple evils in your community and in your life, that is one way to honor Martin King and to keep his dream alive. Thank you for that. So let, let's stay with you, Dr. Martin, for a second here. So has, has your work, has the Institute found what led King to get closer to Martin, uh, Malcolm X and his philosophies? That's the next question. A great question. Um, I think part of um, was disappointment. I think that King um, um, believed and 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 had faith in that America could change um, more quickly. And I think that the kind of racism he experienced, especially in places like Chicago, not the South, which is important for us to remember, but Chicago when marching for open housing, and he saw the way that um, citizens in Chicago and the Chicago as the city, the political culture was so adamant about keeping housing segregated and keeping African-Americans in dilapidated and sub poor housing. I think experiences like that really helped him to see um, that racism was more deeply ingrained in American society, I think, than he had anticipated. And one place I think that we can see where Martin begins to, I, I would argue, learn from Malcolm is even after Malcolm's death in 65, we do start to see Martin pay more attention to ideas about um, cultural aesthetics. And by mm -hmm. that, I mean about beauty, right? Malcolm was so good at helping helping us understand that our skin was beautiful, the way it was made, our hair was beautiful, the way that it came out of our head. Our nose was beautiful, right? He made a point to make sure Black folk loved ourselves. And that was so important because of the way that white supremacy had taught us that, that beauty only came with long straight hair or that noses were to be short and pointy or certain things of this nature, lips were to be small. Malcolm made a point to do that. And early on in King's life, King didn't really make much of an effort towards doing that. Later on, Martin starts to talk about the importance of of Black being beautiful and Black African Americans loving themselves and realizing how ingrained racist ideas were in American life and thought. And I think that's one place we can see where Martin and Malcolm come together. Of course, they never came together on the question of using violence as self-defense. And that's important, self-defense. Not that Malcolm was out just willy-nilly using violence, but using self-defense. Martin and Malcolm would never see eye to eye on that but they certainly would see eye on eye, eye, eye as it relates to the importance of Black self-love and the importance of recognizing Black beauty and Black culture. 
This actually brings up a, 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 another point when I was talking, giving my remarks and I showcased the letter that Malcolm X had written to Martin Luther King and he wanted Malcolm X, I mean, he wanted King to go to New York to participate in a rally. Um, and every time that Malcolm X wrote Martin Luther King, he never responded. He always had his secretary respond in his stead. And um, I, I wish there had been a, a been a, a point in in their lives where they could have been able to come together to have a conversation. And I think because um, Malcolm X was such a, a hot button issue, um, they were never able to, to to bridge that that gap between between each other. Okay, let, let's build on that a little bit and just thinking about it, I'm, I'm just really appreciating you all kind of really giving us a better picture of there's Martin, right, in the public eye, private eye, there's all these different things, there's Ebony Magazine, right, there's all these different things that 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 he he did, right, but um, do you think, you know, based off your research um, on his private and public writings, do you think it has been possible to disassociate his personal faith and work and his achievements around race and class. Like, can you separate those things that he, you know, all those different pockets of his identity? This is this is interesting. Um, I would say in terms of his activism, no, right? King's faith is at the core of his activism. His ideas of the Imago Dei, that every human being is made in the image of God, that's key to his activism. So I wouldn't say that Martin King would see preaching on Sunday morning as separate from marching in a protest. All those go together for Martin Luther King Jr. Mm -hmm. But I, I will say, I think, and I try to tell my undergraduate students this all the time, King is also a site where we can learn the dangers of not having a balance between one's calling and vocation and family. You know, what we, being immersed in these materials and things that I've learned from Tanisha and being here, you know, we learned that Martin Luther King Jr. at times was so committed that at times he was dropped the ball as it relates to his fam familial commitments. One example we can offer that we know about um, is the Nobel Peace Prize. Martin Luther King Jr. wins the Nobel Peace Prize in 1964. It comes with $25,000 in 1964. That's a lot of money, right? King says, I'm giving it all away. And Coretta, says, well, wait a minute, right? You've got children, they're gonna need to go to college. You got four kids, four kids. They need to go to college. And Martin and Coretta were very clear that, that any moment his life could be over. So Coretta said, you know, you're not gonna be around much longer. So we don't know that. So make this money should be used for our children to go to school. Martin, no Coretta, I don't wanna be seen as if I'm getting rich off the movement. Gives the money away. Now, that's a moment, in my opinion, right, that we could see that his commitment at times was so strong, and we honor him for that. But it also was somewhat damaging, I think, to the family in the sense that not providing for them. He was very, very, very concerned about being seen as rich. He didn't want to own a home. He didn't want to have a life insurance policy. I learned from Tanisha. Harry Belafonte was involved in making sure he had a life insurance policy. So things of this nature, I think, is where we could see King's commitment was so strong at times, it left him um, um, maybe not as being as responsible in terms of his family. Um, and I think that's a lesson we all can learn from him about balance and making sure that our callings and our commitments don't take us away from our, another primary commitment, which is to take care of our loved ones and those who depend on us. Incidentally, he always, um, any any money that he obtained from speaking engagements um, centered around the student uh, around the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, he also gave back to the movement. And his father, I, I, I was just looking at a document a couple of weeks ago where it was a um, meeting minutes and his father was saying, listen, Martin, you really need to allow SCLC to pay you. You, you need the money because at this point, the only thing that that is paying the bills um, is he's a halftime um, uh, pastor at Ebenezer Baptist Church. And so what they tried to 
get him to do was to take a salary from the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And he said, absolutely not. He would not do it. And he only took $1. And that was because he needed insurance. So he took a dollar. So there's a question here. We'll see if we can squeeze in these slides two if we can but is there any connection between the hoover institute and the mlk center uh I'm no that's quick uh, okay no 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 we don't have any any <laughs> official connection other than the fact that we know the director um the great uh secretary of state condoleezza rice and we see her on campus uh but there's no um we recognize her shoe game is tight but other than that no we don't have much of a much of a connection all right, so we'll, we'll ask the last question and I want it to be sort of broad so that you all can take it to wherever you need it to go, whatever you didn't get to share with us or drop on us. And, and it's just something thinking about what, some, what are some research projects or other projects that you are doing right now? What are you excited about today, right? In the center with the King's paper that will take you forward. Give us a little something to chew on as we think about what's next and what we can expect from you all. Volume eight is coming and it's coming soon. Um, we are very excited. Um, in December, we sent the manuscript off to readers for their comments and suggestions. Um, and they're coming back and they're coming back with great comments, great suggestions. Um, so we're really excited about that. There's always a, a sense of excitement around uh, a manuscript that is ready for someone else to read. And so um, we're excited uh, and joyous about that, but we're also um, looking forward to the hard work ahead. We've got a lot of work ahead of us, but the volume will be published in, in 2024, 2025. That depends on, on UC Press. In addition to that, we're excited about the possibilities here on campus, uh, about what we'll be able to do um, here on campus um, and collaborating with some of the new initiatives on campus and how the King Institute will be a part of that. So we're excited about that, excited to celebrate the new volume with um, the community and our alums. And I would say on a, on a personal note, as a scholar, what I'm excited about um, is revisiting King's childhood. Um, I'm really interested in thinking about how does one, how did one become Martin Luther King Jr.? So thinking about his time from birth up until the time he decides to go into the ministry when he's 18 years old. I'm very excited about that. It's a way to provide um, a type of context that he didn't come out fully formed, right? He didn't come out saying, I want to be a change maker. He was a human being who smoked cigarettes and got in trouble and at times <laughs> had bad grades. Um, he rode his bike and fell on his bike. He delivered newspapers, right? I mean, so I'm really excited about helping to provide context into what goes into making Martin Luther King Jr. as the, a research project as well. So we're just really excited about all that that's happening right now and the future of the Papers Project and the Institute. And we were just really thankful for the opportunity to share some of this with the uh, alumni network. Well, we thank you for that that inside peek, right? We did, we all learned a lot. I'm gonna speak for everybody. I know we're not supposed to do that, but I know we all learned a lot. Um, and so we appreciate that. And so we didn't get to every question. I know we tried, but it's so rich. But as you heard from our panelists, go see them, check out the website, get some more answers to your questions. Um, our time today has come to an end, but thank you all for attending and for your thoughtful questions. Thank you most of all to our panelists. You were wonderful. We learned so much. Have a great day. See you later. <laughs>